Lord for the last. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for Thee. Even Thy cup of grief to share, Thou hast poured on for me. Lest I forget. verse 5. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for the way you provide for us. We pray, Lord, as we study from your word this morning, you give us insights and give us direction, comfort us, and teach us what we, what we need to know. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, at the end of verse 5, it says they were confessing their sins and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now, you know, uh, today we're used to this idea of baptism, um, but then, you know, it was a unique concept. And... Uh, and it was so unique, in fact, that that's how, you know, John got his, his nickname, John the Dipper, John the Immerser. <laughs> now, uh, they, there were, you know, ritual cleansings that, that they would do uh, when, when they would enter into the, the temple for worship. If you were a, a Levite or a priest, you know, you had to go through these... Uh, various washings uh, for ceremonial purposes. But the only baptisms that occurred were for Gentiles. Gentiles that uh, wanted to become Jews. Uh, they would be required to say certain things, and then they would immerse themselves. Um, and the symbol of immersing themselves was to say, you know, I'm, I, I'm changing my identity, I'm aligning myself, you know, with the, with the Jewish people. I'm no longer a Gentile. I want to be a part of, of the people of God. But John was preaching a baptism of repentance for the Jewish people. And so he's telling people that if they want to be ready to meet the king, uh, that they needed to repent and that they needed to be baptized. And he said, for the forgiveness of their sins. They need to get their hearts right with God. So it wasn't enough to be just born a Jew. You know, it wasn't enough to just be a part of the covenant people. Um, it wasn't enough to just be circumcised. So John's saying, you're not okay the way you are. And um, you need to confess your sins. You need to come and repent and be baptized, you need to be immersed in water and to, uh, to find forgiveness 
and to have a have a fresh start for the coming of this uh, Messiah. So this was kind of a, a radical thing that was going on, and it really upset the Jewish leaders, you know, because they understand the significance of it, you know, because this is a humbling action. It was it was an action of submission. And it was, you're doing this publicly before God and before all these witnesses, too, that, that whoever's there that day. And so verse 4 says, John preached a, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, repentance uh, is a change of mind. It's a, it's a change of direction in your life. It's, uh, it's confessing that, that your, your condition isn't right, you know, and that your life is, is full of sin, and, and you're admitting that the direction, the path that you're going on um, is not the right path, and so you need to do a 180. And uh, so you have to make the necessary changes in order for that to happen. And that's what repentance is all about. You're, you're turning towards God. Instead of following the path of self, and and uh, you're you're wanting God's mercy, and uh, you want to change your ways. And uh, repentance, along with baptism, it says is for the forgiveness of sins. It was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now this is a little bit confusing because you know this isn't Christian baptism. Now that's going to come later. Jesus hasn't died on the cross yet. He hasn't been raised from the dead. In fact, Jesus hasn't even appeared on the scene yet. So this isn't Christian baptism. In fact, some were baptized uh, by John, and then later um, they had to be rebaptized um, in the Christian baptism. Remember, they I don't know if it was Paul or Peter, one of them came across these guys that were baptized by John, but not... Christian baptism. So, um, and so, you know, when we're baptized into Christ, we're, we're buried with Jesus as he was buried in the grave, or resurrected with Christ as he was resurrected. And so at this point, you can't do that because those things haven't happened yet. Um, but at this point, it still was a baptism for forgiveness of sins. Um, and, you know, there would be some people that were baptized by this baptism uh, that maybe died before all those other things happened, before Jesus uh, died and rose again, before Pentecost happened. Um, you know, there's people dying every day. And so there's, this is, for now, at this time and place, this is what you needed to do. This was God's calling. Later, there would be a, another calling for a Christian baptism. But at this point in time, you know, this was the appeal, you know, to get right with God. And so this, this was the only baptism available. But it does say it was for the forgiveness of sins. Um, and, but the one that would come later would also include the, the Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit would be a part of the baptism that you were baptized into Christ. And so that would be a, a new baptism. Verse 7, and this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. So remember, this was the, the first prophet in over 400 years, and uh, the Spirit of God was upon him, and uh, thousands of people were coming out to John to hear him, and but his message is, it's not about me, you know, he's pointing to someone else. He's saying, you need repentance, you need forgiveness of sins, but this is so you can be ready for the one that's coming. I'm not that person. John says he's superior. He's, he's, I'm not even worthy, he says, to untie his sandal straps. This was the job of the, the lowest slave would do something like that. He says, I'm not even worthy to be his lowest slave. Um, <clears throat> so everyone's coming out there, you know, to see John and to hear John, but he says, I want to tell you about somebody else. 
I want to tell you about somebody greater. And that was his mission. His whole mission was to prepare people for the Messiah that would be coming. That was his job, to get them ready for that. Well, look at verse 8. John says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is going to come and he's going to be a game changer. John is a game changer too. But when Jesus comes on the scene, he'll change things even more. He's going to bring them into the new covenant. And uh, with the new covenant comes the, the cross and the resurrection and the, the whole idea of, of redemption. Remember he talked about that at the Lord's Supper before he died with the twelve. That the cup that they were to drink had to do with the redemption, had to do with his dying on the cross and all those things. Noreen. Do you think this just occurred to me when he said, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit? They probably had no conception of what he meant. Do you think? Yeah, probably not. I mean, people, a lot of people today don't really understand the Holy Spirit. Do any of us. <laughs> I mean, it's easier, to, the concept of a father, because we all had a father, yeah. and the concept of the son, if, if you haven't had a son, maybe you were a son, or you know a son, but uh, the concept of a spirit is a little bit harder for us to get our minds around, so, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, they probably were a little bit, you know, not understanding, but a lot of these things that were taught, you know, um, they were taught... Uh, in advance, you know, so that when they did happen, they kind of already had an idea about it. Jesus talked about all kinds of things that were coming. Like when we talked about, when, he was, when we studied in John, you know, about Nicodemus, he was talking to Nicodemus about things that hadn't happened. And Jesus gets lifted up on, on the cross and all of that. And Nicodemus is probably, you know, not really understanding everything he meant. Um, and then he, he talked to his 12 about events that were happening when they were totally clueless about his being betrayed and his death and resurrection and all these kinds of concepts, but he still spoke about them and taught them. And then when they happened later, then they looked back and said, oh, okay, now we get it. Um, so even though maybe they didn't understand exactly what John was talking about when he was talking about the Spirit, um, you know, later it would make sense. So, and maybe some did pick up on it, you know, but probably a lot of them did, yeah. So, um, so yeah, with the, with the coming of Jesus, would, he would bring the Spirit, but not until he left. Remember, he said, I'm going away so that the Spirit can come. And it would be greater. I mean, they, they were uh, really kind of fretting and had a lot of anxiety with Jesus leaving, but... It was better with the Spirit because with Jesus, he could only be in one place at one time. With the Spirit coming, the Spirit can be everywhere. He can be in every heart, every soul, all over the world. So it's really a better deal that after Jesus has done his work, he sends the Spirit so that the Spirit of Christ is still with us, but he's with each one of us individually. And so that's what he's promising. And his job was to, to convict hearts, too, to bring them to that place of, of repentance and uh, to intercede for us and to comfort us. And the Spirit had, had many jobs that he did. Well, let's move on, uh, verses uh, 9 through 13. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and a spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven, uh, you are my son who I love, whom I, I love, um, with you I am well pleased. And at once the spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days, uh, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels attended him. So Jesus comes to John, you know, just alone among all the other thousands that are coming to John to be baptized. You know, no one except John knew who he was. 
Nobody else could distinguish who he was. Um, he was just another pilgrim there along with everybody. And, you know, he, uh, he came from the most unexpected of places, it says from Nazareth in Galilee. And Nazareth was a, was a small village, a few hundred people. And it's never even mentioned in the Old Testament. Um, and it's never mentioned in writings like uh, Josephus in the first century. He talks about a lot of different cities and places and things, but never, never, never mentions Nazareth. But because it was just a small little town that no one ever really talked about or regarded as anything. It's kind of like uh, Langlois, uh, South Abandoned. You know, it's just, you're there and then it's gone already. So, um, and that's why, you know, when Nathaniel hears that Jesus was from Nazareth, when we studied that in the Gospel of John, he says, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? Yeah, David. So is there a connection between the town of Nazareth and the Nazarite vows? Um, that's a good question. I'm yeah. not sure. It just came to mind. Uh-huh. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how the Nazarite vow got its name, but possibility. But uh, the Nazarite vow was around a long time ago. Yeah. It was back in the Old Testament. Yeah, Samson, yeah. remember Samson yeah. had to take the Nazarite vow. So that was the time of the judges. So, but uh, I have to look into that. I don't know how the Nazarite vow got its name, but um, and he was also from the region of Galilee. Now the Jews living in Jerusalem, they kind of uh, saw the the region of Galilee as kind of a backwards place too. You know, they kind of looked down their noses on the people from Galilee. Um, and it was mostly rural areas, you know, and the people in Jerusalem and in Judea area, they kind of saw themselves as a little bit superior um, to those up in Galilee. And, uh, yeah. Backing up to when he was in the desert, Tom McCurdy was listening to, pointed out that Mark's the only one who says, he was with the wild animals and as though in a peaceful way. I mean, he doesn't say. Yeah, it is an interesting. Yeah, so sort of that paradise we picture the lion and the lamb may have not be. Or maybe they were out to get blood. Who knows? Oh, they could have been. <laughs> it doesn't say they were friendly to him, it just said he was with them. Right, right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting what kind of, uh, I'm not sure what kind of uh, wild animals they had, but, but John, you know, John was out in the desert all his life, too, so he, yeah. he was uh, used to that kind of thing, but Jesus hadn't been, so, yeah, I'm not really sure what that's implying exactly. Um, so Jesus comes on the scene, and no one, you know, no one was expecting the Messiah uh, to come in the way that Jesus came, he just plain, ordinary guy. You wouldn't know who he was. He didn't stand out in the crowd. Uh, remember when we were studying the book of Isaiah, that Isaiah said he had no beauty or anything to attract you to him. He just he was an ordinary person. And so Jesus comes down from Galilee, which would have been a long trip. Remember we talked about how just even the people from Jerusalem coming out to see John would have been several hours to get out there. And so if you were from Galilee, you know, this would have been a long trip. But he comes to Judea uh, to be baptized by John. And after this moment, life is never going to be the same for Jesus. Everything's going to change because he, he uh, you know, at this point he's lived, uh, Luke says he's 30 years old when he gets baptized. So he's lived 30 years without anybody paying attention to him really. Nobody knows anything. His parents do, but even his brothers don't because it says they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe he was anything special, you know. Just like we think of our own brothers or sisters. <laughs> Not really that much special, you know. Sure. Uh, so they didn't believe in Jesus, but his parents did. You know, they, they, the angels spoke to both Mary and Joseph. They knew he was a special child. 
But for 30 years, can you imagine, you know, so Jesus goes from just total seclusion to this, you know, the masses surrounding him at this point from every day. So um, it was quite a change. But uh, so he, this is his, you know, his point where he was going to start his missionary work. Um, and it's going to be a difficult path for him to be on, you know. It's a, it's a path that led to the cross. But even before he got to the cross, you know, he was, in a, in a symbolic way, putting himself on the cross, carrying his cross, because he was serving people. Remember, Jesus said, I, I came to serve, not to be served. So he was always had this servant type of attitude. But his baptism was the beginning of, of it all. It's kind of his inauguration, you know. He's, he's baptized, and uh, he, he receives the, the anointing of the Spirit, and uh, the Father, you know, puts his blessing on him too, and then that's the beginning of how everything happens. So Mark, uh, Mark gives the, the shorter version, you know, of these events. He doesn't give all the details like you find in, in Matthew or in Luke. Yeah. When it says that Jesus uh, had the Holy Spirit come down, uh, when John's people that he baptized, they didn't receive the Holy Spirit. No. 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 Just Jesus. No, only the Spirit didn't come until Pentecost yeah. for everyone else. John had the Spirit because God put his Spirit on. You look at the different prophets in the Old Testament, they had an anointing of the Spirit, it talks about. And even some of the judges, Samson, it said sometimes the Spirit would come on Samson to do various feats and things like that. Um, but the Spirit would come on different people, but the kings were anointed, like David was anointed with the Spirit of God. Um, but, um, you know, yeah, the masses would not receive the Spirit until Pentecost. But John had the Spirit, and then Jesus received the Spirit at his, at his baptism. But Mark, he just kind of gives uh, just uh, a lot of the essentials, um, skips over a lot of details. But then in other places, he, he sometimes he'll give more details. It just depends on the story. Uh, Mark sometimes brings in things the other writers don't. But in this in this situation here with the baptism, he, he um, doesn't really give us a lot of details. But in Matthew's account. Um, when Jesus comes to John, John looks at him and he says, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? So John knew this was the one that, that he'd been preaching about. You remember when we studied the, in the Gospel of John, he pointed to Jesus and said, there's the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of the world. So he knew, you know, Jesus, when he saw him and he's related to Jesus, uh, maybe a cousin, but... You know, Jesus was sinless. And uh, John needed to be baptized by Jesus, not the other way around. And he recognized that, you know. But Jesus says, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Now, why was Jesus being baptized if baptism was for repentance and for the forgiveness of sins? Like when you study, right? Um, because Jesus was without sin, and uh, he didn't have anything to repent of. Well, part of what's going on here is Jesus is identifying with his people. Uh, you know, rather than just standing back like the Jewish leaders were doing, just observing all these people getting baptized, um, you know, thinking they're better than everybody else, they don't need, they don't need baptism. Um, part of Jesus' whole mission, you know, was to identify with his people. That's part of just him coming in the flesh, is to identify with us and go through all the experiences that we're going through. Um, our failures and all those, all those types of things. And even though, you know, he didn't have any personal sin, he was a part of the Jewish people who had sinned and had fallen and turned away from God. Now, also, in the Old Testament, the leaders of Israel, like Daniel and Moses and Nehemiah and Jeremiah, 
especially those four, they all prayed and they wept and they fasted and repented for the sins of their people. Um, you know, they had personally committed these sins, but as Israel's leaders or prophets, you know, they kind of took on this responsibility for the, the nation's sins. Remember when we studied in the book of Daniel, Daniel did that. In chapter 9, he opened the windows towards Jerusalem. He prayed, uh, you know, for the people and identified with them even in their rebellion. And uh, this seems to be at least in part, you know, what Jesus is doing here. As the Messiah, he is representing the people as a whole. And uh, he's repenting on behalf of his people, which kind of foreshadows really what he's going to do on the cross. He's going to take all the sins of the people on the cross and even become that sin on the cross, Scripture says. So Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. He's kind of identifying you know, with the failures and the shortcomings of his people. He's saying, I'm with you in this. You know, I'm, I am your representative. He's identifying uh, with their needs, with their longings, um, that God is going to bring about change, that God is going to intervene in this situation. So he's identifying with his people. He's willing to say, uh, you know, religion isn't enough, you know, and things the way they are aren't good enough. And so... He's identifying with the fact that, you know, they need a change. And uh, Jesus was, he wasn't, he wasn't identifying himself as a sinner before God. So don't misunderstand me, that's not what I'm saying. But he's identifying himself with the people. They are a sinful people. And um, he's saying, you know, I'm with you in this whole ordeal. And so he's, he's ultimately... Um, like I said, it's kind of a foreshadowing of what's going to happen on the cross. You know, when Jesus takes on all their sins, even though he hadn't sinned at all, he's taking on their sins himself. Well, that's what the high priest did in the Old Testament. Yeah, When he is. went in once a year, he, he became their sin and their, he took care of their... Yeah, he represented the people. And when he sprinkled the blood on the, the mercy seat, you know, he was doing it for all of the people. He was the one who interceded for God. Yeah, Jerry. He was also setting the example, telling us and doing what we're going to what we have to do in order to have our sins forgiven. Yes. Yeah. So that's another thing that's that I believe is happening here too. You know, he's he he's showing the example for us. Um, you know how to live. WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus got baptized, and so we need to get baptized. Yeah, no ring. And it's the first thing he did, you know, it's the first thing he did. The disciples and the, the Jews had a problem with it because their idea of the Messiah was not somebody who would do that. Whether he had sins or didn't have sins, it was a humbling thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I had read that. Setting an example. Yeah. Yeah, and all of his life is that way. I mean, he he basically uh, Paul calls him the second Adam because he did everything that Adam didn't do right. He was the perfect human specimen. You know, he lived a life without sin. And so all of his life and every action that he did, the way he reached out to people, uh, what he taught about, and the, the things that he did. All of that is something we can follow. We can follow his example. And no one can say, well, you know, Jesus didn't get baptized, so I don't need to. You know, he did, so that's something we need to do. But also, I think there's something else that goes ties into this as well, is that he was obeying what God wanted him to do. Remember, all of his life he says, I'm, I'm not doing things on my own initiative. I'm doing whatever the Father wants me to do. And uh, so you see that too when the Father is speaking out of heaven. He gets baptized and then the Father says, I'm pleased with you for doing that. So he's, you know, he is being obedient to what the Father wants. 
And this is part of the father's plan for him to be baptized. And so part of it's just, you know, his, you know, just being obedient uh, in the plan of God. Um, and uh, like I said before, it's also his inauguration. You know, this is the turning point. Just like, you know, when we become baptized, you know, it's a turning point in our lives. But for Jesus, it's a little different. You know, it's not because he's changing and washing away his sins or anything like that. But it's the beginning of his ministry. You know, at this point in the, when he's baptized, you know, this changes everything. From this point on, people will look at him different. And so this is the mark of that. This is the time that all of that happens. Yes, ma'am. God said, you are my son whom I love with you, I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. It said that it came from heaven, the voice. Yeah. Were they able to, was anybody able to uh, hear it? that uh, It doesn't mention it here. I can't remember what the other ones mentioned. I know one of the times, because he's Jesus, uh, the Father did this three times. And I know one of the times it says uh, that they thought it sounded like thunder. I know of Paul too. They, but I don't know at his baptism that it says either way whether they heard it or not. I'd have to look at Matthew and Luke to see, but I don't I don't remember that it says anything. I, but I do know I think it's the one in John chapter twelve that says they, they thought it was thundering. And which Paul is kind of what happened like when what happened to Paul. Yeah. When he saw the light and Heard the voice and you know they I can't remember which which I think they saw a light but they didn't see Jesus and they heard something but they didn't I, I can't remember one version now. says they heard yeah him. there's yeah. another version said Luke, Luke wrote both so yeah so anyway <laughs> it's 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 uh it's sort of similar to that I think yeah well yeah, Matthew yeah. said yeah, a well, voice from heaven said this is my son didn't it say well, also it that um this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah. Hear ye him. That was not a transfiguration. Yeah, that was a, yeah. And what did you say? I said in, the, in Matthew it says, A voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. I, uh, this is my son. It's like he's talking to somebody else besides Jesus. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. So maybe, well, at least maybe John at least had the insight of what was happening. Like maybe not everybody heard it. Maybe John heard the voice. Uh, but we know John did see the dove coming on him. And uh, it's interesting here, the phrase uh, being torn open, it's, it's a strong Greek word. <coughs> Um, heaven was ripped open, and symbolically, there might be something else going on here, you know, as far as uh, the relationship between God and man, because God is doing something, you know, he's reconciling heaven and earth, he's reconciling uh, God and man, and later on in Mark's gospel, in chapter 15, as Jesus was being crucified, he talks about the, the veil, that split from top to bottom, and he uses that same word, ripping open. And so there might be a connection there spiritually, because that's what happened at that moment, that when he ripped the veil, you know, that we had, at that point, we had access into the throne room of God. We didn't have to go, well, we go through Jesus, the high priest. But there wasn't that veil separating man and God anymore. And so he uses that same word here, and maybe there's some symbolic meaning there, too, that heaven's being ripped open, so now there's there's kind of access between heaven and earth again. Yeah. One commentary put it beautifully. He said the kingdom of God was breaking in into the world. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, time has gotten away from us again, so we'll have to stop there. Father, we thank you for uh, Mark's gospel. We thank you for everything you came to do. You took on flesh and, and uh, 
took our sins and, and tore the veil so that we could have access back to the Father. And, and uh, we just thank you for the example you set, the things that you did for us to follow after you. Pray that, uh, that we might listen to your voice as you speak to us and, and follow your example and help us to do the things that you've called us to do. We ask as we go into worship time, we want to be with us, be with our hearts and minds as we're worshiping you in song and as we're listening to the word. And may you be glorified in everything we do this morning. We pray in Christ's name.